Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. I is a very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing good. It is Sunday. It is 10 a.m. once again, and I welcome you all back to the Hindu news analysis right here on our YouTube channel of Baiju's exam prep. I is. I hope by now all of you have made it a habit to join here punctually right at 10 a.m. Because every single day in this live news prep analysis, we try to bring to you some of the most important articles from the Hindu newspaper. Now, a lot of you in the past have said that whenever we read the Hindu newspaper, we see a lot of articles on Indian polity, we see a lot of articles on international relations, but somehow you all have this issue that we don't see a lot of articles in science, etc. So, if you are in that category, today seems to be a lucky day. If you see the Hindu newspaper today, there are a lot of articles specifically from science and technology. We'll be discussing a few of them today here as well. So, without any further ado, let's see what are the important articles that we have here for you today. The first important article that we'll be discussing today is H5N1, also known as the avian influenza and also known as bird flu. Now, in the past few years, all of us have heard a lot about different types of diseases. So this is not something that any one of us is looking forward to. But the fact is, this disease that is the avian influenza or bird flu has again come in the news, unfortunately. Now, what is the news exactly? Recently, there are thousands of cases of bird flu being found out in birds in UK. Now, in UK or in most of the European countries, they have very, very strict regulations on poultry birds. Most of their poultry birds have a lot of different vaccinations that is imposed on them and only then they are considered to be free of consumption. Even then, we have thousands of cases of bird flu coming up in UK in the past few weeks. Not just this, we have also seen that once the birds actually pass away, there is still a chance of that virus jumping on to some other species. If you remember just a few days back, right here in one of the sessions of the Hindu news analysis, we did discuss some cases of the same avian influenza in some other part of the world. Remember, we talked about how there is a report that in the Caspian Sea, there are different or there are a lot of seals that were found dead and it was expected that maybe somewhere down the line, they seem to be the case of avian influenza. Why? Because a lot of birds in that area earlier were found to be infected by bird flu. So the news is that it is now spreading to different parts of the world. And the problem is when such a disease spreads to a developed part of the world, such as UK, it is even more problematic. Why? The reason being when you talk about UK or the European countries, as I told you earlier as well, they anyways have very tough regulatory provisions. They anyways take care that there's a lot of surveillance, there's a lot of quality checks that are imposed on poultry products. And even then, if you see these cases coming up, that means it is now a very, very serious concern. It is also a serious concern because humans also are not away from this impact. There have been multiple cases of human beings dying of bird flu in India as well. And that is why it has again become a matter of concern. Now, scientists say that if you're consuming poultry products and if they're cooked properly, then you are not at risk. As per the scientists, a bird flu virus is actually very sensitive to temperature. And in India, anyways, you know, most of the things that we cook are at very, very high temperature. So when you are cooking something, any poultry product perfectly well, you can be rest assured that the virus will be destroyed. That is what the scientists say. However, that is still a very, very dangerous sign because it is still killing a lot of birds. This is also a bad time because India, as you know, is considered as one of the world's most favorite destination for migratory birds. And this is the season where a lot of migratory birds actually fly into India on their way to their final destination. And that is why there is a concern that we might see many more cases of avian influenza in India also amongst the birds, especially the migratory birds, as India has seen in the past as well. So the question is what can be done and why is it that India is very, very prone to this? Now let's try and understand this. 
So basically, how exactly is it that this virus transmits from one bird to the other bird? Let's try and understand that first. As per the experts, these viruses, they go from one bird to the other bird through either liquid that is shared by different birds or through the facial matter. That is through the excretion of one bird. If that excreta, let's say, get mixed up with water and that comes in touch with some other bird that also has a big, big probability of transmitting the virus. So number one, by sharing common food. Second, by sharing common matter. Thirdly, by excreta. Fourthly, saliva. These are some of the things through which the birds can also spread virus from one species to the other species. This is where we have to understand that in order to control avian influenza or bird flu, the most effective technique as per the experts is ensure there is wastewater based epidemiology. Now, what does it mean? In India, when we earlier had cases of avian influenza or bird flu, what did India do? Our approach was that whichever bird was dying, we were undertaking a test of dead birds only. And we were seeing how much is the virus load, how can we stop these birds from transmitting virus. In India, we did not really actually use water-based or wastewater-based epidemiology. Now, what does it mean? What it means is that those water bodies which are nearby those areas where there are a lot of birds or poultry farms, the water in those water bodies should be tested because as per the author, as per the experts here, the most easiest way for this virus to spread is through water that is shared by these birds. So any water body which is nearby the poultry farms, any water body which is nearby a good significant population of birds, that water body has to be checked because that water most probably will have these viruses and that has to be clean. In fact, even we see the developed nations undertaking these kind of checks only. A lot of developed nations ensure that the wastewater is treated properly, that the wastewater nearby the poultry farms is tested properly. The reason being that the virus spreads from fishes, saliva, nasal secretion, etc. And that is why we have to ensure that in India also, rather than just conducting tests on the dead birds, we also ensure that we undertake proper study of the wastewater, the water bodies that are nearby these kind of bird species. In Europe, that is being done at a large scale. In India also, we have to do the same. Rather than just depending upon a certain population of birds that are dying or rather than thinking that by killing the birds we will be able to ensure that the virus doesn't spread from the birds to the humans, that is a wrong way forward. Because even in the last cases when the avian influenza actually started in India, we started culling of birds. You might have heard this phrase, culling of birds. Culling of birds means killing birds. So when we thought that the birds or, or poultry uh, animals, etc., they are the ones who are the carriers of this virus, we started killing them in large numbers and we thought that it would not spread to humans. But again, that is something that did not stop the virus from going ahead. As I told you earlier as well, recently only we did discuss that there are cases of a lot of seals passing away in the Caspian Sea. This is the article that we had discussed. It was just about 10 days or so back. So this virus is now being seen in different parts of the world. There were cases in Russia, now there are cases coming up in UK, there are cases coming up in different parts of the world that becomes very, very, very dangerous. Now the Indian Express a few days back gave a very simple language data about everything that you needed to know about this virus. For example, as per the experts, Migratory aquatic birds are the carriers of this influenza A virus. They mostly shed this in their dropping, so in their excreta, and that is how it spreads from one animal to the other animal. It can go to pigs, horse, cats, and even dogs. Among the humans, the first ever case was detected in 1997 in Hong Kong. Since then, it has spread to other parts of the world as well, including India. In fact, from 2003-2014, WHO said that there were 701 cases of H5N1. 
that is avian influenza out of which 407 people died this is again a cause of concern because if you see here the ratio of people who are catching virus to the number of people who are dying that is extremely extremely high and that is what remains a big big cause of concern here in India as I told you there have been multiple outbreaks of this virus in the past in 2006 we saw the first major outbreak in Maharashtra Gujarat then 2008 2016 and in 19 as well as I told you earlier as well, I'll repeat once again as per the scientist if you are properly cooking your poultry product you can eat eggs you can eat chicken whatever you want but if you are cooking them properly at optimum temperature then you are safe you would not have to worry about that because this virus is sensitive to temperature when you bring it to higher temperature they will be destroyed however the problem here is even in last few cases whenever we have these kind of outbreaks the first reaction of a common man is you will stop eating eggs you will stop eating these kind of poultry products now this is a good precaution but on the other hand when a large population all of a sudden decides I'll now not consume eggs I'll not consume other poultry products that means you are also harming the occupation you are harming the jobs of many other people who are working in the poultry sector so the government also has to decide how to tackle this on one hand people are concerned about their health so yes they might take certain steps of not consuming these products on the other hand we might see a situation where the poultry industry is impacted because the jobs will be impacted when the demand for these products actually comes down the next article that we have from Hindu newspaper worth discussing today is about stock market regulation in India usually you will see there are not a lot of questions asked about stock market regulation in India although there are a few questions about SEBI here and there SEBI being the very very important statutory body that regulates stock markets in India now over here the reason why this is in the news and I'm sure all of you know about this is the Supreme Court recently asked the SEBI what provisions do you have in place to stop stock market volatility now what exactly do we mean by this as you know ever since the Hindenburg report came out there has been a lot of volatility in the stock market when we say volatility that means the stock prices are increasing or decreasing as a, at a very very rapid pace now the problem is when the stock prices of any stock not any specific stock when they increase or decrease at a very very rapid pace this is usually not considered to be very safe for the retail investors see those who are experts those who are big companies those who are experts in trading they know how to take advantage of every situation so they can understand how to actually make money even in difficult situations but for a common a short term investor an investor who is just a common man putting money in the market hoping that his or her money will grow over the years for those investors it is not good that the stock market has so much volatility because there has been a lot of up and down in the stock market the supreme court recently asked sebi do you have or what reg provisions do you have in place to stop volatility from the stock market so that is why this article has been written how does sebi work what are the powers that sebi has and what is it that the sebi does in such cases now as you know sebi here stands for security and exchanges board of india let me write it here for you securities and exchange board of india it is a statutory body that was given statutory status in 1991 this is a statutory body that has a responsibility of regulating the stock market in India now everything regarding the stock market for example making rules and regulations for companies who want to come and offer their shares ensuring that the investors are also safeguarded ensuring that all the contracts are being fulfilled so if someone promises that I will give you money and you give me shares in return it is SEBI who has to make sure that that exchange actually happens so everyone is abiding by the promises that they make otherwise punishment to be imposed on them all of that is the responsibility of SEBI S -E -B -I, to ensure that the stock market in India is robust and it is working perfectly SEBI has been given a lot of powers and we'll just discuss today power such as imposing certain fines imposing punishments even banning people that you can't trade in India 
banning companies that you can't raise funds from the market if you are not following the rules and regulations. So SEBI in fact has all these powers given to it under a lot of different laws including the Security Contract Regulation Act, the Depositors Act, the SEBI Act 1992 and even the Companies Act. Now understand this, when the Supreme Court asked SEBI, do you have regulations in place to stop market volatility? Understand this, yes, SEBI has to make sure that the market is not very volatile. However, SEBI cannot stop the stock market or the prices from increasing or decreasing. SEBI does not have that responsibility because the price of any particular stock will be decided, will be determined by supply and demand. SEBI does not control that. What SEBI can do or what SEBI has to do is to make sure that the price that is growing up or the price that is going down, it is not going up and down because of any false news or it is not going up and down illegally. As long as it is all legal, for example, what happened in the Adani ish case and the Hindenburg report case, there is nothing illegal that went on. There was a report that came in and report said that we think there are certain wrongdoings happening in the company. The report did not file any case as such. Then it depends on the buyers and sellers of the stock. Those who wanted to sell the stock, they sold the stock. Those who wanted to buy the stock, they bought the stock. So nothing illegal happened there. So understand SEBI in that sense does not interfere in the market as soon as as long as the things are happening legally. Yes, to ensure that there is not a lot of volatility, there are certain circuit breakers imposed by stock exchanges. What are circuit breakers? So basically circuit breakers is a mechanism to ensure that the price does not fluctuate so much. For example, if the circuit breaker is 10%, that means if the stock exchange goes up to 10%, the trading will stop for some time so that the volatility is sustained. On the other hand, if the stock market goes down by 10%, even then the trading will stop for some time. So this is just an example of how circuit breakers work. Circuit breakers are not imposed by SEBI, circuit breakers are imposed by stock exchanges. For example, we have the National Stock Exchange, we have the Bombay Stock Exchange, these kind of stock exchanges that we have, they have their own upper and lower circuits to prevent excess volatility. For SEBI, it is more important to ensure that all the companies that are involved in trading, all the people who are involved in trading, those are following rules and regulations. Let's take a simple example. If you have ever bought a stock or if you ever sold a stock on any app or any platform, what do you do? You just place a request online that I want to buy these many stocks or I want to sell these many stocks. Someone somewhere in other part of the country, you don't even know who will agree that okay I will buy your stock. You have never met the person who will buy your stock. You have never met the person who will sell your stock. But even then you both trust each other. You deposit the money hoping that you will get the stock in your account. On the other hand, the other person gives the money hoping that yes, the exchange will happen. Who is the body in between that makes sure that these contracts are honored? That is what SEBI does. This is where SEBI comes into the picture because if you have taken the money, you don't transfer the stock or if you have taken the stock, you don't transfer the money. In that case, it is SEBI that will come into the picture. They have the power to impose regulations. They have the power to impose even punishments and fines on those people who are not abiding by that. If you saw this famous series on Harshad Mehta scam, you would have seen how the role of SEBI has increased ever since 1992. So before 1992, SEBI was not formed as a statutory body. Please remember, it was only 1992 that SEBI was given the statutory status. I hope all of you know, there are usually three types of government bodies. They are in three categories. There are executive bodies. There are statutory bodies. And there are constitutional bodies. Executive bodies means the ones that are formed by just an order given by the government. So no law passed in the parliament, nothing written in the constitution, just 
an order issued by the government of India will create a body called an executive body like the Niti Ayo. The executive bodies are very easy to create just by giving an order and they are very easy to remove also. Next government can come in, pass a simple order just like that and the body will be removed. Then there are statutory body. Statutory body for example are those that are made or that are created by an act of the parliament. When the parliament of India passes an act, that is how you have a body that is created. SEBI for example, Lokpal, NHRC, all these are statutory bodies. TRAI, Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. So in order to make any changes in statutory body, you have to change that law in the parliament. So if you have to make any change in the statutory body, you have to pass a simple majority bill in the parliament. And then the third are constitutional bodies. Constitutional bodies will be the ones which are created by the constitution of India. The UPSC, the Finance Commission, the CAG, the Election Commission of India, all these are constitutional bodies. If you have to create a constitutional body, you have to amend the constitution for that. So you require a special majority. So the basic difference between the three is, Constitutional body is the most difficult to create and the most difficult to change. Executive body is the easiest to create and the easiest to change also. So that is how these are different. SEBI started as an executive body, became a statutory body in 1992. By the way, and let me give this very small homework to you. Can you give me an example after the class ends in the chat or in the comment section? Give me an example of a body that was first a statutory body and then it got converted into a constitutional authority. Very simple homework. Tell me in the comment section later on. A body that was first started as a statutory body and then got later converted into a constitutional body. You can talk, think about that. Anyway, let's come back. So basically as I told you, SEBI has the power to regulate the stock exchanges in India. Because SEBI came into being in 1992, obviously before that also, there has to be a body that was looking after this. So while SEBI became a statutory body in 1992, before that also we had a body from the government of India to look into this. What was that body? That was called Controller of Capital Issues. Do remember this name. Before SEBI came into being, there was a body called Controller of Capital Issues that looked into the same kind of function that SEBI did. However, SEBI took up this function in 1988 first as an executive body and then in 1992 it became a statutory body. SEBI right now has a chairperson and they have whole time and part time members as well. They look into all these issues regarding the stock market exchanges. Now, understand this. Let us assume that there is an issue where SEBI has put certain punishment on a company. Let's take an example. Let's say a company promised that we will buy back the shares of our shareholders at a certain price. This is a very usual occurrence. A company can promise that we will buy back the shares of our shareholders, but they did not do that. They did not <coughs> fulfill their promise. And later on, let's say if SEBI impose a certain fine on them, then the decision of the SEBI can be challenged where Securities Appellate Tribunal. Do remember this is where SEBI's decision can be challenged. Now, apart from that, the interesting part is even the decision of the SAT can be taken up further. If you are still not happy with this decision, you can still go to the Supreme Court of India. That will be the final authority. So if SEBI takes a call to impose certain fines, to impose certain punishments, you are not happy. You can go to Securities Appellate Tribunal. If you are not happy with that also, you can still go to the Supreme Court of India. Their decision will then in that issue will be considered as final. As I said, SEBI has a lot of powers. They mainly are responsible towards three stakeholders, three key categories. First, issuer means the companies who are coming to the stock market to raise money. Then investors like you and me who invest money. And then intermediaries. Intermediaries basically can be those companies who work as stock exchange brokers. For example, let's say if you have an account with Sher Khan, Zerodha, Paytm Money, Grow, etc. Those can be 
the intermediaries. The intermediaries will be those who are involved in the working of this entire stock exchange. All their interest is taken care of by SEBI. The interesting part is government of India has given some power to SEBI even beyond this stock market. As per the companies, as per the Security Law Act of 2014, SEBI is also responsible to regulate any money pooling scheme worth 100 crores or more. Money pooling scheme means when many people come together, they, it's a bigger version of a kitty party. Kitty party is nothing but a money pooling scheme, right? When a lot of people come together, they pool in money, one of them, whoever name comes on the lottery, the person gets the money. Similarly here, any money pooling scheme above 100 crore that will also be regulated by SEBI. So SEBI now has powers even slightly beyond the stock market as well. Before I move on to the third write-up, let me quickly take up if there are a few questions here. Um, Kishan is saying only wastewater based epidemiology is a solution. No, see, there is no solution to bird flu as such. Wastewater based epidemiology will give us a better chance to understand where are the chances of even influenza or bird flu spreading to a larger extent so that we can actually make sure that the action can be taken in that particular area. So it would make us better prepared rather than saying that this will end the disease that will not happen. Uh, then quasi yeah, SEBI is a quasi judicial body quasi judicial body means a body that can conduct certain investigations and have almost half of the powers as the courts would have so they can act as civil court meaning that they can ask for evidence they can ask for people to come there as a witness and investigate the matter that they have within their bounds okay then uh, Nitish is saying, does SEBI listen to finance ministry? Not really. No provision as such. Okay. Then I'll take one more question. Does SEBI has overseas jurisdiction for punishment? So SEBI can give punishment to those companies only or to those individuals who are investing in our stock shareholder market or in our stock market. That is what their jurisdiction is. They can't go overseas as such. They can issue orders with respect to those who are involved in our stock market. Okay, I'll take one last question. Who solves corruption complaint in SEBI? So SEBI chairman, the members of SEBI, that is what they do. They investigate the matter. They call for all the evidence, witnesses, and then they decide if someone is guilty or not. Perfect. Then the next topic that we have, again a very interesting topic from again GS3 science that is based on polio vaccine. Now you might ask why is the polio vaccine in the news all of a sudden? Hasn't polio been eradicated in India? The answer is yes, polio has been eradicated in India. But recently what happened was the West Bengal government announced that they will be introducing an additional dose of polio injectable vaccine in the universal immunization program for children. Now, as you know, children in India are given a whole set of vaccines in their very young days under the universal immunization program. Under this, a polio vaccine is also given. West Bengal government is saying we are increasing. We are, will now be giving one more dose of polio vaccine through injections in India now. Now, why is this happening? Is the polio back in India? What exactly is the issue? See, India has officially been given the status of a polio free country. There is no doubt about that. But the fact is, just because you have become a polio free country doesn't really mean that the polio virus is gone and doesn't mean that you can stop the vaccine. Please understand something here. Even when you become a polio free country, let's say India is a polio free country, you might still see certain cases of polio. Now, how is that possible? If you say India is a polio free country, how do we have some other cases of polio? Those cases are called vaccine induced cases. Vaccine induced cases. Now, what exactly do we mean by this? See, when you get polio vaccine, now, what is a vaccine? 
in most cases vaccine is nothing but very weak germs of that disease so let's say when you take the polio vaccine you are actually given polio virus in your body very very weak polio virus almost dead but not entirely dead why the logic is that when your body actually gets this kind of a virus your body will develop antibodies to fight against this your body will get to know oh okay so this is a virus we have to fight against because it's a very weak virus right now your body will then work it will develop an antibody so that in the future if they think or if they understand that they are being attacked by a strong polio virus they will be able to fight against it that is the entire idea of most of the vaccine that is how they work most of the covid vaccines also work in the same manner you get a very weak germ your body gets used to it your body develops antibodies against it so that it can actually fight against a proper infection but what happens is in some cases in india when you give polio vaccine to a child who has a very very weak immunity system understand this if there is a child who has a very very weak immunity system it might happen that that child unfortunately develops polio even from that very weak virus even that happens so there are those kind of cases also that exist in india that because that child was so weak the body of the child had no protection at all that is why what happened was that that child actually got infected by polio even by that vaccine those are called vaccine induced cases so if there are vaccine induced cases of polio even then the country will be called as polio free only so for example in india also we are a polio free country even though we might have certain vaccine induced cases but we are still a polio free country now the problem here is that if someone gets polio let's say through a vaccine induced case etc it can spread how see the single biggest danger how the polio actually spreads is lack of sanitation and lack of hygiene so usually what happens is when people live in a community where there are no there is no water supply where you are not washing your hands properly where you are defecating in the open and you are not taking proper care of them that is when you see the polio virus actually spreads through the entire community that is why polio virus is one of those viruses that you will usually see in those communities that have a very low sanitation or hygiene standard that don't have enough money to take care of their surroundings that is where you have a lot of polio cases now what has happened here is west bengal has had a history of a lot of polio cases so they want to be sure they don't want such cases to return and that is why they have increased one more dose of polio this po dose will be given at the age of 9 months along with the existing doses as you would know there are three types of polio viruses called type 1 type 2 and type 3 by the way can you tell me quickly out of these three type 1 type 2 and type 3 can you tell me which of these has been eradicated completely from the world which of these out of type 1 type 2 type 3 has been completely eradicated from the world or have all been eradicated what do you think okay i am getting type 1 type 1 so the question is out of these three types type 1 type 2 type 3 which is completely eradicated okay most of people are saying type 1 which is absolutely wrong so basically type 2 and type 3 have been eradicated type 1 has not been eradicated type 1 has not been eradicated type 2 and type 3 have been eradicated from the world there are type 1 cases mainly now in two countries afghanistan and pakistan afghanistan and pakistan still remain the countries with a lot of polio cases they mainly have type 1 cases while type 2 and type 3 have been eradicated now as i told you earlier as well the ongoing vaccines will continue in west bengal they just want to give even more protection to the children and that is why they are increasing one more dose so right now the polio vaccine is given at birth at 6 weeks then at 10 weeks at 14 weeks also and there may be a booster dose later on as well now the sad part here is again 
in other parts of the world also type 2 and type 3 polio virus which is eradicated completely there are some samples of that virus found even in the most cleanest cities in the world for example recently what happened was there were studies being conducted on wastewater in Jerusalem, London, New York, some of the most developed countries. They saw that there were some type 2 polio virus strains even in London and New York wastewater as well. That has surprised a lot of scientists. Why? The surprise being that it has always been understood that polio usually spreads only because there is lack of hygiene, there is lack of sanitation and only then the polio virus would spread. Now if you talk about London, you talk about New York, these are some of the cleanest cities in the entire world. These are some of the most hygienic cities in the entire world. And even then, if in their wastewater, we are finding these strains, that is a big cause of concern. One other news that came up a few months back, in fact, this was, if I remember correctly, December 2021 or somewhere near that. Mozambique in Africa has detected its first case of polio in 30 years. So polio is not entirely dead. Polio still has its existence. And as we discussed, even in the developed nation, there are certain polio strains that are now being formed. Now, as I told you, there are three main types of polio viruses. Type 1 still exists. Type 2 and type 3 have been completely eradicated. What does polio do mainly? So polio mainly attacks your nervous system. When we say nervous system, that means they attack your nerves. So your nerves become so weak that even to do your day-to-day -day functions, your body will not really support you. As a result of which, what happens is, in many cases of polio, your muscles become so weak that you are not even able to breathe. And that is when the people actually pass away. So polio also has a lot of fatalities there is no treatment for polio but there is a vaccine for polio the difference being if you take a vaccine you will not be infected but if you do get infected there is no treatment that will cure you so rather than waiting that i'll take a medicine it is always best advisable to have vaccine at at a young age as soon as possible and that is why in the end polio has been such a dangerous disease because there is no available treatment even in the most developed countries and it can weaken your nerves to such a large extent that you will not even be able to breathe in certain situations it can spread from person to person but usually it spreads through facial oral route and by common vehicle as well through contaminated water contaminated food so basically as you can understand the best way to be safeguarded against polio is to clean, keep clean surroundings if you have cleaner surroundings, if you are maintaining hygiene, then there is a good chance that you might not catch polio. And that is why usually you will see these kind of cases only coming up when you talk about those communities which are living in a very congested place, which don't have proper hygiene, such as slums, etc. There are countries such as Pakistan and Afghanistan that are still going through this crisis. Also remember, if a country has to be declared as polio free, as India has been declared as polio free by the WHO, in case that has to be the case, the country has to get rid of all three types of polio viruses. Polio virus 1, 2, 3, only when all these three are removed, only then the country can claim to be polio free and not before that, not just because of polio virus 1 or polio virus 2. The next write-up that we will discuss is about one of the most significant parts of our armed forces. It's a part of our Central Armed Police Forces. This is a write-up on ITBP, Indo-Tibetan Border Police. Now, Indo-Tibetan Border Police is a part of Central Armed Police Forces, that is a part of CAPF. As you know, apart from the Indian Armed Forces that work under Ministry of Defense, that is the Indian Army, Navy, Air Force. Apart from that, you should know, we also have something called Central Armed Police Force, CAPF. There are multiple forces under CAPF that work under Home Ministry.
one of these forces, one of the most important ones is the ITBP. Now, ITBP has always played a stellar, stellar role in India's defense. They are mainly important because of the reason that they are one of the few armed forces in the entire world that are properly trained for mountain warfare. So their specialty is mountain warfare. See, not many countries around the world have this kind of a topography that India has. When we look at our border areas, look at different countries with which we share a border. For example, when you talk about Bangladesh, there are river borders also. There are certain rivers, water bodies that are half in India, half in Bangladesh. Look towards China, some of the highest mountain peaks that you will see, this is where our border lies. So you require special types of people to arm our border. ITBP here becomes extremely important because they are one of the world's few forces that are properly trained for mountain warfare. So all the people working in the ITBP are expert mountaineers. They are experts in those situations where temperature can come down to as low as minus 45 degrees Celsius. Minus 45 degrees, just imagine that. And they are still able to conduct their activities. They are still able to ensure that all their activities go on as smoothly as possible. Now, this force, the ITBP came into being after 1962 India-China war because the government realized that if we have to maintain the similar kind of relationship with China, we have to ensure there is a force at the border that is able to work in these circumstances as well, who are able to ensure the mountains are not a threat to them, who are able to work properly at higher altitudes and that is why the ITBP came into being. Recently, the Cabinet Minister Committee on Security approved seven new battalions for the ITBP for deployment in Arunachal Pradesh specifically. So there are different borders that India shares with different nations and at different borders, we have different forces who have been given the responsibility. So India-China border is the responsibility of ITBP. In fact, Please take this homework as well in the comment section later on. Do tell us what are the forces that man the India-Myanmar border? And then what about the India-Nepal border? And what about India-Bangladesh border? What are the different forces that man these borders? If the ITBP is for India-China, then which is the force for India-Myanmar? Which is the force for India-Nepal? Which is the force for India-Bangladesh? As I told you, there are specific forces that have been given the responsibility that this is your responsibility, that is your responsibility. So make sure that you learn about this also. This is extremely important. Now, the ITBP has had a lot of specialist training to ensure that they are able to handle all the difficult types of terrains that they have to counter against China. Earlier, only a small part of India-China border was handled by the ITBP. But after the Kargil war, the government of India realized that there has to be one single force along the entire border. So after Kargil war, ITBP has been given the responsibility on the entire India-China border. Also, it doesn't mean that their only responsibility is India-China border. India-China border maintaining peace there is their primary responsibility. But apart from that also they have taken up multiple roles. They have even participated in multiple wars in the past as well. For example, they have participated in India-Pakistan 1965 war, 71 war. They have even been involved in counter-insurgency operations in 2004 so it's not that they will only be for india china border as and when the government sees their utility they will be called into service they have also been extremely active in disaster management whenever there is any disaster in the himalaya region especially because they are the ones who are best used to that terrain because they are the ones who are expert mountaineers whenever there's a natural disaster in himalayas the itbp is usually the first force to be called because of their expertise, they have even been asked to serve the country outside India as well. For example, they have protected Indian High Commission in Colombo. They have even been deployed in Afghanistan in the past. They have been, even been given President's top honor of Police Medal for Gallantry because of 
stopping the terrorist attacks in Afghanistan when they are protecting the Indian consulates. So as I told you, there is a lot of utility, there are a lot of different types of operations on which the ITBP is involved. India-China border peace maintenance remains their primary responsibility. But apart from that also, there are a lot of different operations where they have been working. One more good part about ITBP is, this is August 2021, ITBP inducted its first women officers in combat as well. So they even have women officers who are working in the combat positions in ITBP. So again, a force that is not just work, that is not just manning our India-China border, that is also setting examples of gender equality as well. As I told you, ITBP is a part of Central Armed Police Forces. They don't work under Ministry of Defense, they work under Ministry of Home Affairs, do remember that. These are the other CAPF forces. So, Assam Rifles, BSF, CISF, when you go to airport for example, or Delhi Metro etc, you will see the CISF. There is CRPF, that is usually called into Naxal areas etc. IDBP, NSZ, especially for terrorist attacks, Sashastra Seema Bal, all of these are a part of Central Armed Police Forces. They have their own cadre of officers, but they are all headed by people from the IPS. In fact, this one single line is also a big, big, big problem in these forces. A lot of people working in the ITBP, for example, do not like this. They think that if we are working in the ITBP, for example, a BSF, for such a long time, why is it that IPS will come in from outside and head our force? We should be the one heading our force and not someone from outside. Similarly, I'll give you one more example. When you talk about CAG, usually the officers who are working under the CAG are IAAS. IAAS is Indian Audit and Account Service. So usually under CAG you will see Indian Audit and Account Service officers. But what the government does, when they have to appoint the CAG, then they will bring an IAS officer from outside. So these officers also are very unhappy that we are working all through our life in the CAG and when it comes to coming at the top position, you bring an IAS officer from outside, that is very bad. Similarly here also in the CAPF, the officers don't like the fact that they work their entire tenure to get to the top job and when it comes to top job, the IPS will come in from outside and take that job from them. So again, not very happy about this. The next topic that we have here is about rural tourism, the potential of rural tourism in India. In the past also, if you remember, we have discussed about the potential of tourism, the different types of tourism activities that the government of India has been giving a push to, including medical tourism, rural tourism, agri-based tourism, etc. The article here says, there are a lot of very unique villages in India. There are a few examples given here. For example, Mathur village in Karnataka, where residents only speak in Sanskrit. There is the Mashli village in Maharashtra. It is an agrarian homestay which is very beautiful, surrounded by coconut, beetle, banana plantation. Bishnoi village in Rajasthan, which very usually has a great Indian mustard coming in. So there are so many of these villages in India that actually can be tourist hubs for people not just from India but across the entire world. That is why the Central Nodal Agency for Rural Tourism and Rural Homestay is now coordinating to identify such unique villages in India so that the government can promote them and the government can invite more and more tourists. For example, as per this Central Nodal Agency, they want the tourists to come in and experience six main experiences. What are these six experiences? Art and culture, agri-tourism, eco-tourism, wildlife, tribal tourism and homestays. As many as 134 villages have already been identified. Because see, it is not just people from India. If you look at foreigners coming into India, a lot of them don't come in to see high-tech malls, don't come in to see very high-tech buildings because they already have all of that in Western nations. So when a Western country tourist comes to India, he's not looking for great buildings, etc. architecture because they already have that. What they are looking for in India is is an authentic Indian culture, something that they might not find in their own country. And that is why rural tourism becomes extremely, extremely important. So 
Apart from these villages, there is also some villages in Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Nagaland. They have their own unique specialities. And this is where the government of India, especially the Union Tourism Ministry, is working to ensure that we give a push to rural tourism specifically. We have discussed earlier as well, tourism remains a very, very important part of India's growth story in the coming years. It gives a lot of employment. It also brings a lot of foreign exchange. It brings in a lot of opportunity for the government of India to showcase what India has. That is why even the G20 summit that we have, you will see meetings are being held in different parts of the country. Meetings are being held in Rajasthan, meetings are being held in Mumbai, in Delhi, then we have meetings in northeast part of India, in South India, so that everyone can ensure that they can get the true taste of India going ahead and they can recommend the same to their friends going back. Recently, the government of India released a draft national tourism policy, which I want to discuss with you. The government of India released a policy of how to give better push to tourism. It said that we will focusing on ensuring that some taxation breaks are given. Why? When COVID-19 pandemic hit, one of the sectors that was most significantly hit and became almost zero was the tourism sector. People stayed at home, many homestays, restaurants, hotels, all of them closed down. So they deserve certain incentive from the government. So government is planning to give them certain relief. Government is focusing on green tourism, digital tourism, ensuring that MSME sector also gets a lot of push from the government. If you look at how India has the potential as compared to other countries, there are very few countries in the world that can claim to have forest, mountains, deserts, snow deserts, and even the most warm areas in the entire world, the Western Ghats. Such a variety is not really found in other parts of the world. Being in India, you can one day be on the beaches, the other day you can be on the highest mountains in the world. Third day you can be in rain, trop rain tropical forest and fourth day you can be in the desert and you can go to cold desert so on and so forth. And that is why India has so much potential. India ranks 10th worldwide in terms of contribution to world GDP when it comes to tourism. Countries such as France, Italy, Switzerland, they have a lot more tourists coming in. But India right now can actually surpass them very easily if we ensure that the challenges that we are facing are overcome. What are those challenges? First big problem, lack of infrastructure. In a lot of tourist places, even the basic amenities are missing. Basic amenities such as washrooms, such as waiting rooms, such as place to rest or even charge your mobile phone, etc. Parking facilities are missing even at the most important destinations. And that is why a lot of tourists don't come in even today. There is also an issue of safety and security. There are still issues of people duping foreigners of money. When you see, and it's a very common practice, you will see that when an Indian person comes to a shop, they might offer something for let's say 500 rupees. At the same time, when a foreigner will come to their shop, they will say, sir, this is very cheap, only $50. So we have to stop this practice. Just because you see that there's a foreigner coming in and you start charging a much higher price, start duping the person, thinking that the other person will not know, that is not a practice that will help us going forward. Similarly, the lack of skilled manpower, we don't have enough guides who know foreign languages, we still don't have enough trained people who can handle the request of the tourist, that also remains a challenge and seasonality is also an issue, meaning that since India has such variations in seasons, we don't see the same kind of or same number of tourists coming in throughout the entire year. There may be some season when the number of tourists coming are very high, other seasons the number of tourists actually drop down. So the people who are employed in this sector, they also have to ensure that in the end of the day, we have to give them jobs throughout the entire year and not just in a few months. This was our discussion of the important articles from this Sunday's the Hindu newspaper. There are a couple of practice questions that I really hope that you try and write answers to. Discuss the potential of rural tourism in India. What measures and precautions should be taken to promote rural tourism? Second, with SEBI, India has a robust regulatory body in place 
to handle any volatility in the stock market do you agree elaborate i hope this was helpful for all of you and i hope that you utilize this sunday revise everything that you have studied throughout the entire week so that you are in touch with everything that you are reading make sure that you do leave the comment section with the answers that i have asked you i'll check those answers and hopefully we'll meet very soon with the next hindu news analysis have a good day ahead bye bye jai hind